Hey guys, here's what's sick about the G3 Kings Indian for white. You see, this game is by between David and Navarra, playing as white against fellow Grandmaster Buster and Adiban. At this point, Navarra just says, Oh, yeah, I call you the beast, you're the Indian Mihal Tal. You think you just go H5, H4 and hack up my king? Well, yeah, nice try. You know, with my Fianco Kings in, I've got the space, I've got the solidity, I've got that beautiful bishop burning down that long diagonal, and you've got nothing. I mean, you can't make the tactics happen. I'm just going to squeeze you to a pulp like you're a lemon. I'm going to make a lemonade, and I'm going to have a special drink celebrating at the bar when you're done, buried, dead, and cremated. Illingworth Chess, the best place to improve your chess. What's up guys, it's Gia Max here, and as you probably guessed from the start of this video, we're going to sing the praises of the G3 Kings Indian. Now the beauty about the G3 Kings Indian is that it's an opening where you can give like a very unpleasant choice. Either they can beg for a draw, and you know, they don't have a guarantee of achieving it, they still have no chance of winning the game and getting their usual big attack on your king, or they can try to go for the big attack, get counterplay against your position. But then you just bang out the engine moves, bam, 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 and black is simply in a worse position. Now, if you are new to the channel at Lingworth Chess, make sure to hit that subscribe button. I've got a little icon on the bottom right of this video. Just click on that, click subscribe, and ding, ding that notification bell to get two Grandmaster Chess lessons from me every day in your feed. So that being said, let's now get into the actual game, where the normal move order for playing the G3 Kings Indian is to go D4, C4, and after G6 going G3 and, you know, just playing like the Fiend Keto setup. You guys might notice it's the Catalan setup, which is what's called if you black had gone E6 and D5. You know, you can check the suggested video for more information there. And then after castles, you know, you can just play moves like Knight C3 or Knight F3 or castles first is fine as well. But with Knight C3, you make it hard for him to get in a D5 push and kind of get them to commit to this pawn on D6 and the you know, King's Indian territory as it were. Uh, so that's not the standard move order, but one slight disadvantage is you do give Black the option of playing a Grunfeld. Like, they can go for the move, for example, of d5 and get a more open kind of Grunfeld, which I don't think gives White a decent chance of an advantage, but it is something to keep in mind that they can do this. And if you're looking at the games of the top Grandmasters, most of them are going to play the move c6 and just put a pawn on d5. And the idea is that that way, when White does play cd5, if they do make the exchange... It allows Black to take back a pawn and kind of put the blot on that G2 bishop. And, you know, in a symmetrical structure, it's not that easy to turn White's extra tempo into a real uh, tangible advantage if uh, both sides just keep developing normally. So for that reason, the virus says, okay, I'm going to be a little tricky with my move order. I'm going to start with the English opening move order with C4. So that way then after Knight F6, Knight F3, if they play their usual King's Indian, I can delay this move of D4 to try to avoid some of these Grunfeld options. For example, let's just say, if let's have to bishop g2, if black would have played a move like d5, well, white can try to benefit from the fact that he hasn't played the move d4 yet. You know, he can play, for example, moves like knight to c3, and so I've delayed a move d4 just to try and not give black a target for this pawn. So there are ways which can try to be tricky with the move order. Of course, so delaying the move d4 does give black some extra options. For example, he could play a move like c5 and get more of a symmetrical English territory. That's definitely a way Black could play it as well. Uh, but the one advantage is that, let's say, if Black were to play some move like c6, well, it gives you some extra options where, for example, instead of just putting the pawn on d4 and having a normal Fiend Keto Grunfeld, you could play the move b3 instead and get this kind of structure up, say, d5, bishop b2. You know, let's manage to get this very flexible double Fiend Keto. When the move c6 is a little bit passive, you know, Black would rather have played c5 and taken over the center with pawn on d4. So that could give White some small chance of a pull in this case. So in any case, let's get back to the game though, where Black played castles, White played d4, and now we get back to our Fiend Keto King's Indian Territory. And I'd gone to get my engine overlord ready, but now, you know, he's all set up. And while the engine is, you know, chugging away, you know, making loud running noises, do make sure to smash that like button if you're enjoying this video so far. It really helps with the YouTube, I uh, boost that YouTube algorithm. And also it means that you know, more people are going to see the video. And of course, I know it tells me to make more videos like this for you guys in the future to give you the crowd what they want. In any case, Black play move Knight BD7 going for the, let's say, active attempt. Like if Black wants to get active counterplay, he's usually going to play Knight BD7. Uh, the other major approach for Black, like there are a lot of 
lines that black can play in this position, you know, in general against sidelines, knight c3, and take over that center with pawn e4 tends to be a pretty good plan. But what about the alternatives? You know, black does play a move like c5. There are a lot of ways you can play it, but if you want to try and get the maximum value out of the move order, the safe approach is to go d take c5, and then play knight e5 and just use that extra tempo in a symmetrical position. You know, it's not so easy for black to develop that bishop on c8, because we got the Caline Bishop, you know, breathing fire down that long diagonal, you know, like how to train your dragon. But it turns out, well, that if you prefer to be more courageous, like uh, Hiccup, then you can play the move d5 instead, and that's going to transpose back into a Fianchetto Bononi type position. You know, for example, you can play Knight c3. There are creative tries like d6 as well that you can also explore, but Knight c3 is kind of the standard move. And then you get this Fianchetto Bononi where Okay, it's true that the g3 bishop g2 is not the most active sub in the world against the Benoni, but it's very safe, and you know, one pattern you're going to see over and over again in these Catalan type positions is, with the bishop on g2, it's very hard for black to get any sort of attack against the white king. Usually he's trying to get more moves like rook e8 and trying to get some knight e4 counterplay, but there are different ways you can play it, like even a move like rook e1, and just trying to prepare the e4 break yourself is a pretty good shortcut. Whereas nowadays the modern trend is go bishop f4 and kind of show up that this pawn on d6 is a little bit of a weakness. You know, if y is able to get knight d2 and knight c4, then yeah, that pawn could come out of some real peace pressure. And in the middle game, e4, e5 is going to be your typical plan to try to open up the center and turn that d pawn into a pass pawn by trading e2 for d6, as it were. So that's generally what you're going for here is white. Obviously, I could go a lot deeper, but certainly this is a decent overview. Uh, well, what if they play knight c6 instead? Well, knight c6, again, is an approach that's a bit more direct, where in the old days, people like to play what's known as the pano setup, which is where you go a6, and then you go rook b8, and you try to chip away at the queen side with b5. It's a quite an active-looking approach, but it's one where white does seem to have a few ways to an advantage. For example, if you really want to avoid b5 altogether, one decent way of doing so is to go bishop to f4, and then meet rook b8 with rook c1. And the idea of rook c1 is that you're just making it much harder for black to gain his usual b5 push, because now b5 does have a little bit of a problem with it. You know, can you guys see what white should play in response? You know, do make sure to comment below with the move that you would play in this position as a good way to test your understanding and your knowledge of these plans. So did you guys manage to find it? You know, I'll have a little drink of water to give you a chance to pause the video if you need a bit more time. So uh, good job guys if you resisted the temptation to play the seemingly pawn grab c takes b5, a takes b5, and knight takes b5. You know, first you might think, well that just wins a pawn max, this was easy, but there's often in chess the key to playing well is to look one move further, not just jump to conclude and say, yeah, I just play this and I win, but to realize that black has the move rook takes b2, he's hitting that pawn on a2 which is isolated, and now your black is actually the one with an initiative with that rook on the second rank and... You no, know, I do think that black is a little bit better because his pawns are still all in one pawn island. If it was late in the end game, maybe that outside pass pawn's a strength, but in the middle game, it's going to be just more of a weakness than a target. So hopefully you didn't do that. You didn't fall for my trick. You know, just because I'm the guy saying the exams, you know, I'm going to try to throw some troll questions in. But the real idea is to go knight d5. And what's really good about knight d5 is that if black were to take that knight, you'd go c takes d5, and those pawns might be doubled, but they're also... Doing a really good job of controlling the center. You know, white has a 3 to 2 central majority white right now. And you also get this really nice pressure down this long this C file, which we can back up with the queen. And you don't really want to go knight b4, because white can just play queen b3 and just keep those uh, forks pawns defended and you know boot the knight away later. It's just very, very depressing for black. So instead, black might play some like bc4, but still you get that kind of pressure down this C file. Well, we kind of see after rook c4, you know, this backward c7 pawn. It's going to be a weakness that we can attack, and you know, black's just very passive, is not getting his usual counterplay. That's why you're usually going to see black play moves like h6 and try to get something happening on the king's side, or he'll play bishop to d7 and try to get in b5 that way. But now I find you can still play like queen d2, you know, you can still meet b5 with knight d5 and still get that initiative down the c file. So that's the approach I'd recommend as kind of a lazy approach as it gets a pretty safe advantage for white. And it's also not the most common move, so it's something that could easily surprise your opponents. The other good approach is just to play b3 and you know, meet rook b8 with d5. These like to be quite sharp. You, know, you are sacking a bit of material after knight takes d5. But if you look into a complication yourself, you're going to kind of see it. white does 
get an advantage in these lines with correct play as well. That does a good approach if you want to just keep control of the position and kind of nurse that space advantage. This is always the reason why Black normally is switched to the move e5 and trying to hit back in the center that way. But I think that in this case you have two good options. You can either play d5 and bishop g5 and just have some decent pressure down these, uh, these long diagonals. Black has a bit more space, but has more peace activity. And nowadays, like, the modern trend is to go knight d5. Like, I did a video for my Inner Circle Mastery members recently, where I kind of showed that these sort of positions with bishop f6, and with the opposite color bishops just a little bit better for white, because after knight e7, e4, this bishop's kind of stuck. Whereas white's sort of nursing the space advantage. He can pressure c7, his bishop still has a little out with bishop a3, to take some squares. And I kind of like white's chance a little bit higher at this point, for what it's worth. Uh, or you can just play d5 and just have a slightly improved, like, Mardo Plata King's Indian. Because normally a bishop would be on e2, but here with the bishop on g2, it does a really good job of defending the king. So at f5, f4, g5, g4, it is not really so easy for black to get in. Or even if he does get it, it's not really leading to a mating attack by comparison. Okay, I've talked quite a lot about the different old trains, but at the same time, it is true that there, when you play like a kind of system opening, yeah, you give yourself a lot of flexibility. But you also give the opponent a lot more options as well at the same time. So it's kind of good to be sort of ready for that. In any case, Adipan said he wants some, you know, blood on the board. So he played the move knight bd7, trying to keep a bit more tension in the position. And it's also the way that I like to play the king's in as a kid before I realized that the king's in, in well, has its, its problems, let's say. Because, uh, yeah, when you're a kid, you're like, I have this romantic sort of vision, like, oh, king's in here, like, it's a kid. Like, it's like all these kind of puns, like, you know, oh, I was going to play the Grunfeld. Nah, just kidding. I played King's Indian instead. You know, had all these kind of different puns that we like to say, like me and my coach. But anyway, we had the move E4, just taking the center. And I mean, the main move for black is to play C6. But I find that after the move A3, that white is a little bit better in these positions. That if they wait too long, like say they play rookie 8, A5, queen C7. At some moment, you're going to just play D5 and just sort of have this extra space in the center. You don't want to play d5 too soon, because otherwise knight c5 could lead some annoying pressure on the e-pawn. But if you time it right, it tends to work quite well. Uh, if they play queen b6, I find that the c5 pawn sack gives you a really good play. Okay, you might be wondering, well, Max, why is it a pawn sacrifice? Aren't you just getting rid of the center? Well, it turns out to 98, you can't really keep that pawn alive. But the good news is you don't really need to. You can just play e6 and, you know, you get this position where you sack the pawn, but it's kind of hard for him to defend this pawn a convenient way. You meet 95 with f4, you get your pawn on e5. Now, Tom Lash just shut out their bishop and just leave them with a very ugly structure. You know, the queen side majority is not really going anywhere. After something like knight f7 takes, bishop d4, king to h2, rook f7, and e5. You know, it's a fairly straightforward plan. You kind of see the black king is sort of a bit lacking in defenders. The knight has a really beautiful square on e4 where you can go to some very juicy outposts from there. And even just a plan like h4, h5, and just chipping away at that 2 6 pawn going for the attack, it's just going to be really unpleasant for black in the long term. Because you can see, like, the bishop on c8 and the rook on a8 and the queen b6 are not really doing a lot. I would highlight it, but then, you know, it would look like a castle painting, not a chess position. And, well, maybe you'll prefer to have your art on the chessboard instead. Uh, in any case, uh, well, instead, black played the move of a6, which is not the most common move. The more main trend you kind of see players play is this move of ed4. Like, there's sort of like the modern main line where people are going to play moves like knight to c5 and try to put some pressure on the pawn. But I find that falls a little bit flat. You know, even if you just play a move like queen c2, for example. You know, if they play rook e8, you can just play like rook d1. Just put that rook opposite the queen. And you always have a move like f3 if you need it just to overprotect e4. And without a good pawn break like d5 or something, it's very hard for black to really manage to break white space advantage. And let's say if you play a move like rook e8 instead, try and keep your cards closer to your chest. Well, you can just play bishop e3, and again, like knight c5, f3, we kind of see that this is falling a little bit flat for black at the moment. That white's just doing a very good job of consolidating the space. He can play moves like queen d2, put the rooks in the center. And it's very hard for black to get any sort of meaningful counterplay in this case. So, of course, there's a lot more fear. You know, they can try moves like c6, a5, and... They can try to create some queenside counterplay, but it just doesn't seem to work if white is a little bit prepared and just plays in the center. So it's kind of the reason why I sort of find that, well, if you're going to play King's Indian, you still have to accept either, do you get this to try to get counterplay, but where you're just basically worse, or you play some line that's kind of solid, like knight c6 e5, or like pawn to c5, but where you're not really sort of getting a lot of winning chances if white just wants to play safely. So it's a little bit of a dilemma that black finds himself in in these lines. 
Uh, in fact, you're also welcome to comment below, like, you know, like, what's your take on the King's Indian? Like, what do you find frustrating about? Do you find the King's Indian, like, Fiend Curve version frustrating? Or do you have some special weapon that you like to play that you have good results with? Well, Black played move A6. Navarro just played the move A3. Uh, it's a very thematic move in these positions, just to kind of stop any Knight G4 and keep that King really well protected. Uh, you can also play Queen C2 and Rook D1, like I showed before. I find this to be a pretty good plan, because often... In a lot of these positions, like takes, takes, and rookie eight, there are a lot of cases where black is going to want to play some move like c6 or some move like c5. So having the rook on that d file ready to attack that weak pawn on d6 can be really a very useful prophylaxis. Uh, but why play h3 instead? Uh, we had e takes d4. Knight takes d4, and this line of like where black plays now with bishop to e3 and rook b8, it's known as the Gallagher variation, and the idea of the Gallagher variation is basically go knight e5. And then go C5 and B5 and try to create the count play on the C4 pawn. I still remember, like, back when I was studying this book on the King's Inn, played at King's Inn by Joe Gallagher. Like, his nickname, I think, like, Smokey Joe. And, you know, later he stopped playing chess and went on to and get more into poker as such. You know, a lot of chess players realized that, well, I could earn $50,000 a year, like, playing the chess circuit, like, playing for clubs, like, doing a lot of private coaching or whatever. Or, you know, I could just, you know, use my mathematical skill, play lots of poker, and, you know, live the good life, like, just, you know, grinding those tables, as it were. Uh, actually, I know, like, another, like, Otomar Ladfa, he, like, won really big in a poker tournament recently. So, yeah, there's a certain, like, similarity where chess players are often drawn to poker as well. You know, even play a little bit for fun just with some play money on poker stars. But anyway, you didn't come here to roll the chips or to learn, like, how to bluff the opponent. You came here to learn how to bury the King's Indian, and so that's what Navarro did. He played the move B3, which is a pretty solid move in the position. I do think that the move A4 is also interesting. It's a very committal move, but you are stopping black getting in B5. So it's sort of just saying, yeah, on the one you are weakening the dark squares, but you're also saying moves like A6 and Rook B8 don't really have that much point to it if you're not getting in B5. Well, after the move B3, black played a move knight to E5 here. And I think that, yeah, in this case, again, the move A4. I mean, it's sort of a move that sort of on a strategic level, it might look a bit weird to play because, you know, you might be thinking, well, Max, what about A5? Like, aren't I just weakening this square on B4? And there is some truth to that, but you're also, the b5 square becomes weak as well. Like, if we imagine, let's say, that white puts a knight on b5, like, say, in a position like this, for instance, well, black can't really kick that knight away with c6 so easily, because that pawn on d6 is under fire. And if you put a knight on b4, yeah, the knight looks pretty on b4, but it's not really doing all that much. Like, you kind of play around the knight, you know, go f4, grab space, and it's going to lead to a somewhat similar position to what we're going to see in the game, actually. Well, white played rook c1, definitely a healthy move as well. And you, know, you might be wondering, well, if the whole idea, Max, is to go c5 and b5, well, why didn't uh, Adiban just play this immediately? You know, c5, b5, and you know, just pile that pressure on that c4 pawn. I mean, it's not at the point, like, in these King's Eam positions, often you're going to see black go for either e4 or go after c4. Because, I mean, it's not like you're going to be able to make the white king when you don't have a lot of space, you know, around that king, like, you know, f5, f4, or this kind of jig. So it makes sense that Black's going to try to chip away at the center, but unfortunately it's just not quite as effective. And in this case, I think the move f4 is just very, very strong. If knight ed7, it turns out that the move queen d6 is really powerful. Like, there's a lot of theory and there's really space to go into this in a vast amount of depth. But the point is if Black does go b4, trying to kick the knight away and try and get a knight takes e4 to destroy the center, it turns out that e5 is actually a very strong piece sacrifice. After b takes c3 and knight takes c3, Maybe white only has two pawns for the piece at the moment, but it's very hard to find a good square for the knight. And if you play a move like knight h5, for example, white can just go g4. And a knight is still going to be trapped. You know, knight g3, you've got rook f3, and we kind of see that, you know, queen h4 being met with bishop f2, that black's basically losing the knight and not really getting the condensation for the prawn, as it were. Um, so, yeah, that's basically pretty, uh, pretty rough for black. Uh, and, well, that's sort of, if he goes knight c6 instead, well, we might know about loose pieces drop off. Like I said a million times in the video, you know, like John Nunn likes to say it as well, and he has an IQ of 180, so worst people that you can quote. So yeah, we have the move E5, and yeah, you just hit this knight, and you also hit this knight as well at the same time. And it is actually a threat to play E takes F6, because if they go rook E3, you would be hitting that bishop on G7 at the end, so you would pick up two pieces for their one, and you know, two for one. Well, it might sound like some garage style, but it actually works out here. In any case, we have the move bishop to D7, uh, Navarro played move F4, like, you know, Navarro also a very aggressive player. Actually, he's one of the most fighting players of the top 100 on David Spurn's Fighting Chess Index. So the game went knight to c6, only square for the knight. 
And you know, in this position, I guess there would be some players who'd want to go knight d2, trying to keep the pieces on the board when you've got more space. But then black gets in b5 and he would get some counterplay against that pawn, which I think is something you'd rather avoid in principle if you can help it. So Navarro instead played a move king to h2 at this point. And while with king h2, it's kind of a sensible enough move. I think I would have probably played the move queen d2 instead, just made sure my rooks were connected and all of my pieces were developed. But this move is also playable. Uh, I mean, I think that black should play the move knight takes d4. You know, just be able to... Because with every piece of black trades, it just reduces that cramp a little bit. For example, you might get a c6 square for the bishop now, which you didn't have when the knight was sort of blocking in the way on, on c6. I mean, white's definitely still better, but at least you can try and make a fight of it. You can play moves like b5 or even c5. At least try and get some sort of share of the space, rather than just letting white, you know, have the McMansion, you know, six bedrooms for one person kind of thing. Uh, well, black played move h5 at this point. Uh, white played move rook to e1, just keeping her defended in. Well, what Navarro kind of realized is that h4 is a little bit of a, a stab in the dark. Because white will just go g4, and that pawn can even end up being a weakness. You know, moves like knife free and bishop f2 can gang up on that pawn later on, for example. Uh, so black plays queen c8, and now... Again, I'm a bit surprised that, you know, Navarro's allergic to moving the queen. I mean, I don't know, does he want to, you know, say, Oh, I'm a grandmaster, I'm a genius, I don't need to move the queen. It can just sit there, you know, just doing, you know, but basking in the sun, you know, getting a little suntan on it or something. Uh, so instead of playing queen, you're getting that queen working, you know, getting it off of the beach. Well, Navarro plays bishop g1, uh, which I mean, it's an okay move as well. The one disadvantage of most bishop g1 is that after knight d4, you are going to kind of lose a tempo moving that bishop, but... Since your bishop is getting a more active square, and since black has zero counterplay, it means you can still play the second best move, third best move, and still have a very good position. Like, the king's in the Infiant Keto is very forgiving, in the sense if you do play, like, a third best move, it's unlikely to cost you that much, compared to, let's say, if you play, I don't know, like, the Black Knight Demon Gambit, or let's say you play, like, the Annie Moscow Gambit, maybe is a better example, where, you're, like, you're sacking the pawn, and you really need to make the attack work in some way, otherwise you're kind of just going to be down a pawn. Well, here now, you know, it's kind of on black to sort of find the good moves to avoid just getting squatched and crushed like a bug. So we have the move C5, and this is already, like, a kind of desperate move. And keep in mind, this was a blitz game between Navarro and Adi Ban. So a move like Queen D8, like, it really requires you to swallow your pride and say, okay, I have nothing, I'm just going to wait for White just to gradually improve the position, just kind of, you know, increase the pressure and hope that, you know, he puts a piece on pre or something. Obviously not the most inspiring move to play. But unfortunately, c5, it's kind of like, you know, out of the frying pan and into the fire. So, Navarro just took the the free free beyond offer. You know, they do say, beware of Greeks bearing gifts, but I say take all the gifts and take the Trojan horse. You can use it for yourself. So, we had takes. We took the Trojan horse in, and then we take the pawn. And, yeah, it's one thing to have the bishops, but it's also another thing to have the center, to have the queen, and to have just all this beautiful stuff. You know, bishop d4 was played, and now I've played move knight d5. A really great move, the knight... Has a beautiful outpost, and you know, that's one big disadvantage of playing c5 as you are weakening those squares on the d file. If they play rook e6, we've got a nice 97 fork here. That's going to allow us to. Okay, queen 6 also works, but yeah, 97, and you're just going to pick up the, the material, as it were. Oh, so black play queen d8. I mean, black is trying to trap this queen, but he's always going to have a square, or he's going to have some knight f6 tactic to kind of keep, uh, keep things under control. Uh, the game ended h4, knight f6. King h8. I mean, if I was black, I would just rage quit by sacking the queen. But yeah, after queen d7. Takes, takes. So wires up a piece. And you know, this opposition at Navarra would win even on his deathbed. But so therefore, Adiban just resigned at this point. Uh, so yeah, a very convincing win by Navarra. You can sort of see how with the queen, if you carry King's Indian, that black really struggles to get any kind of counterplay. And yeah, for those who are here like to try and get all of the great jokes, well, you see the Fianco Kings here doesn't really lend itself to jokes. It's a very serious opening where, you know, you just gradually improve the position. You play steadily and it kind of, it's not really the comedian's opening. It's more like the Zen, you know, person's opening, you know, doing the meditation, being in fact a place of calm. And then when you finally, you know, you get that pawn on E4, the pawn on C4, the pawn F4, and they have no counterplay. When they have no counterplay, for say, finally, in a piece. You can, I can kind of say like by like holding the hands out like you know like in the like yoga sort of pose and like my wife does all the yoga so she should show you on the channel not me but you get the general idea and if you want to have inner peace in your chess games from being a much better chess player then smash that like button it really helps me out do make sure to comment below as well like what are your thoughts on the Fianchetto Kings Indian or what was something new that you learned from from this uh, video 
Because with your guys' viewers share what you learned from the video, that allows us to all take those lessons and use the mastermind principle. Because I mean, a thousand brains are better than one. Even a thousand brains are better like the one GM brain. Like, my brain is not better than yours. It's just, you know, got GM title and I, you know, did a little bit of focus training. So there you go. You're going to get GM world title as well if you follow what I do and follow what I say, especially maybe more than what I do. But okay, these jokes aside, yeah, do make sure if you haven't already, just subscribe to Lingworth Chess channel. You know, I've got a little subscribe button here. Uh, okay, it's not going to quite work because I like, blow where my like my uh, fingers are right now. You know, just the bottom right corner. Smash that subscribe button. And also when you ding ding that notification bell as well. And set to all, that's going to ensure you get two Grandmaster Chess videos every day in your YouTube feed with the notifications. So that will make sure you're able to improve your chess just that little bit every day. Uh, that's all I have for you guys for now. Good luck playing Fiend Carry Kings in your own games, or if you are playing as Black, well, hopefully I didn't depress you too much and showed you at least some ways you can play it as Black. So I will see you guys in the next video.